Magic, clever craft, or also known widely as magica, as spoken from the Aleutic language, is a raw, energetic, and primordial force that not only plays a vital role in Tamriel, but throughout all of the Orbis. This raw energy is typically harvested and concentrated by the hands of mortals, Aedra, Daedra, and many other creatures across Tamriel as well as all of Nern are capable of wielding its powers. Those who primarily work with magic are known simply as mages, whereas wizards and sorcerers are much more in tuned with magic potential and have likely studied it throughout most of their lives. There are also battle mages who work with magic but can also find use with most melee weapons as well. All races on Tamriel are known to be able to learn magic to some extent. Some races are much more proficient at others, however, such as elves and Bretons who hold elven ancestry. Magic is understood to be governed by one's willpower and intelligence. Magica, as it is understood, flows from the rifts in the Void of Oblivion, created by Magnus, the god of magic, and the Magna Ghi. These rifts and tears in the Veil of Oblivion are known as the Sun, also going by the name of Magnus, as it was created by him, and the Stars, created by the many different Magna Ghi and other Et'ara who decided to flee Mundus. Magic envelops every being, from flora to fauna and beyond, and can be exploited and controlled in a variety of ways. Even though magic has been in the hands of mortals since the dawn of time, it has and likely will never be truly fully understood, as many different mortals will spend their lives endlessly studying this raw and primordial force. It isn't quite known how magica is truly generated, other than that it flows from Aetherius into the Mundus, comprising of Oblivion and its planes, as well as Nern. Magnus, the god, designer, or otherwise known more popularly as the architect of Mundus, was the figurehead of magic use and the construction of Mundus. After Mundus was created, however, Magnus for a mostly unknown reasons terminated the project, and this is when he and his followers, known as the Magna Ghi, decided to flee Mundus, and in doing so tore rifts and fissures into the Vale of Oblivion, fleeing to Aetherius. The sun, also going by the name of Magnus, is the largest hole in which Magicka flows through, along with the stars being the holes torn by his subordinates, the Et Ara and Magna Ghi. The stars are known to play pivotal roles in the births of mortals, as mortals see the alignment of the stars as what can determine the skills that person might be born with, such as their talent at wielding Magicka, their talent with stealth, their skills in how they would wield weapons, along with their general fortune and destiny. Substances which fall from the sky, such as suiting stars and other meteoric materials of sorts, are greatly sought after for their intense magical properties. Magnus is known as Magris to the Khajiit, and holds the same title and sphere that other Tamrielic nations hold him for, as the god of magic. In Khajiiti folklore, Magris is one of the many sons of Honor and Faramai, and Magris tends to be quite popular among Khajiiti mages. Magnus's staff, simply called the Staff of Magnus, is a well sought out for artifact by mages, that is arguably his most well known and powerful artifact, said to be wielded by him himself during the creation of Mundus. It is told that this artifact of his is the only object known to be able to even contain his near-infinite power. After an indefinite amount of time passes, this staff will pass on from mage to mage, likely to refrain from corrupting a mage with power when they wield it for too long. Another mysterious artifact known as the Eye of Magnus is thought to be an immense relic of Magnus, although it is not known if it is in fact Magnus's eye in the literal sense. This strange and colossal orb radiates pure magica. This artifact is believed to have been one of the key elements that played an important role in the sacking of Sarthal, in some of the earliest recorded historical documents of the Nords in Skyrim. This artifact was collected by the College of Winterhold in the Fourth Era 201, but was eventually secured by the Sigic Order, claiming that the world was not ready for such an artifact. Unfortunately, little is known about this artifact but it is known that it reacts in a peculiar way, 
when the Staff of Magnus is used upon it. Julianos, while considered the divine of wisdom and logic, is also considered by many as a god of magic as well, similarly to Magnus. Worshippers of Julianos are usually followers and practitioners of legislation, academics, literature, history, mathematics, and debates. Many Imperial and Breton wizards and magic users alike typically worship Julianos for his more magical-oriented sphere, as opposed to the more scholarly fields that other worshippers may follow Julianos for. Yunal is the Nordic aspect of Julianos, but has fallen out of favor as the eras have pressed onwards. In the Iliac Bay region, many temples devoted to Julianos are simply and collectively known as the Schools of Julianos. They are more like academic institutions rather than temples or churches dedicated to Julianos. Many who study here believe that the term magica was meant to construe the power associated with performing magic. Some of the earliest fully recorded practices using magic were with the Aeliads in the First Era. The Aeliads had compiled shards of Aetherius, and through these means they obtained immense magical and arcane power. They utilized these magics to enslave many of the human tribes who dotted the province of Cyrodiil. One common phrase in Aeliadic is Av Molag Anyamis, Av Latta Magica, which translates to From Fire, Life, From Light, Magic. With a few omissions, sorcerers, wizards, and magic users typically worked in isolation. This was mostly until the construction of the Arcane University in the Second Era, as well as with the Crystal Tower in the Somerset Isles, and was considered the apex of arcane knowledge and research. Numerous magical techniques and breakthroughs of magic have been developed throughout the eras. These scoped from use in battle, technological advancement, religious study, and many different advancements in medicine. Other unique types of wielded magicka have been developed by mortals as well, such as the Shehai Shen Shiru, the Thum, the wild beast form, sea serpent taming magic, and the diverse and complex machinations such as automatons. There is an incredible amount of very little understood magical anomalies, such as the mysterious towers and their construction, as well as the process of Kim, otherwise known as reaching heaven by violence. Mortal's pool of magicka that they are able to wield is determined by many things, such as their race, practice, research, as well as many unknown influences of what determines their skill in magicka, though no one has the near-infinite reserves of Magnus himself. The potential wielded by that of the Aedra and Daedra are typically referred to as magic, depending on the context. It is believed that deities receive their power and strength in the form of wieldable magic from their worshippers. It is believed that deities with a large amount of worshippers are typically referred to be more powerful because of this. The energy is rendered to magic that they can wield and use to the advantage or disadvantage of all. A number of powerful mages and wizards hail from the Altmer of the Somerset Isles, as well as the Bretons of High Rock, Nibbanese battle mages, Telvanni magisters, and even the Slowed. Most of the leading bodies of government in the Somerset Isles were often advised by the members of the Sigic Order. The Sigic Order studies mysticism and the more ancient and primordial magical studies. However, in more recent history, the Sigic Order is now considered a rogue and much more secretive organization, especially by the Thalmor as of the Fourth Era. However, in the early Second Era, they heavily influenced the political and cultural panorama of Altamary life in the Somerset Isles, and a former ex sigic member, Vanus Galerion, had eventually founded what is today known as the Mages Guild. The Mages Guild had become a popular association for many who wished to learn how to more efficiently and properly wield magic. As the guild had allowed the possession of enchanted items, potions, scrolls, and spells to be bought and sold to any who wished to learn, the easy wielding of magic, and especially powerful magic, was no longer exclusive to upper class or scholarly mages. Along with the Sigic Order and the Mages Guild, there are countless organizations who devote their philosophy around the teaching and cultivation of magic, such as the Crystal Tower, House Telvanni, 
the College of Winterhold, the College of Sapiarchs, the College of Whispers, Shad Astila, the Synod, the Greybeards, and the School of Julianos. Before the events of the Three Banners War, the courses of study that the Mages Guild had implemented was cluttered and dangerous. A Breton woman named Gabrielle Benele had observed that the Shad Ostula Academy had neatly organized and sectioned their magic teaching, notably into eight different schools of magic. She observed that this organization had the mages learning their curriculum in half the time. She had brought this to the Mages Guild as an example to follow, and with it, the Guild adopted this new curriculum, and has greatly enhanced their way of learning. Despite the Mages Guild and magic in general being quite favorable among many who wish to learn more, magic has not always had a good reputation, and for good reason. Many magical studies throughout history have resulted in catastrophic failure, and the Oblivion Crisis is considered to be when magic falls into the wrong hands. Along with the Sigic Order now being considered a rogue organization by the Thalmor of the Aldemary Dominion of modern times, and these two groups have had conflicts scattered throughout history as well. Many modern-day Red Guards consider magic for the weak and wicked, and many Nords after the First Era have favored more with using weapons rather than magic. Necromancy, however, is shared in its detest amongst most of Tamriel. Many frown upon the summoning of Daedra after the Oblivion Crisis. Shadow magic, a more obscure and secret form of magic, is generally feared and shunned upon because of its immense capabilities. To cast a spell, one must consume the reserves of magicka. Casting a spell is considered an incredibly personal and intimate act, as no two people cast a spell in exactly the same way. It can be compared to being an artist. Each mage casts a spell in a different pattern than the next. There are currently seven popular and accepted schools of spellcasting. However, in previous years and eras, there have been numerous others. Each school of magic has its own particular style of what kind of feats they are capable of doing. The schools of magic known, that were once widely taught or currently are, are destruction, restoration, conjuration, alteration, illusion, mysticism, and thaumaturgy. Enchanting and alchemy are also taught hand in hand with spellcasting. However, they are not considered schools of magic, as they do not include the art of spellcasting in them. Destruction is a popular school among those who wish to use spells widely in battle, typically using the elemental forces of fire, frost, and shock. However, this is not limited to those three elements and destruction spells include spells that drain and damage attributes, skills, health, magic, fatigue, making the target weak against specific elements, poisons, or magic, along with corroding the target's armor and or weapons. Because of this multitude of means of imposing damage on an enemy, these spells are quite commonly available to those who study magic. There was once a mage who specialized in illusion named Berevar of Barrow, who preached on the streets of the Imperial City that the School of Destruction should not be considered its own school, and that it should actually be merged into the School of Alteration. Unfortunately, his peers and general audiences did not agree with his reasoning. Eventually, a battle mage named Malviser had shut down Berevar's ideology. It was in the Third Era, 431, that the Council of Mages had concluded that the Guildhall of Skingrad would be in charge of further study and expertise in the School of Destruction. The School of Restoration primarily focuses on the healing and rehabilitating aspects of magic, such as restoring health, stamina, and magicka, granting resistance to the elements, poison, magic, paralysis, weapons, and curing diseases. Restoration can even be used in an offensive way as well, by damaging a target's attributes as well as absorbing them. Despite restoration having a multitude of uses, some mages do not consider it a valid school of magic, or at least as critical as the other schools. Even as far back as the Second Era, powerful spells that could cure disease were known by few. In the Third Era, 431, 
The guild hall and anvil had become the experts of this school, and were responsible for wielding it. Because of the charitable and compassionate quality this school has, this school is quite popular among those who work in temples or in more religious fields. Conjuration is the school of magic centering on the summoning of entities, typically Daedric in origin through telepathy, and some conjuration masters hold the ability to telepathically communicate with each other. Conjuration does not just summon minions, it can summon armor and weapons as well. Despite being a school of magic, the Mage's Guild does not consider it a great school of magic. After the warp in the west, it was when the school took off by storm in terms of popularity, although for centuries beforehand it had been practiced by mages across Tamriel. It is understood that the Dereni clan are some of the first who have utilized this school in formalized ceremonies, chants, and incantations, mostly to make some sort of connection between the mortal plane and the planes of oblivion. Many of the procedures crafted by the Dereni clan are still in place today. At one point in history, this school also comprised of spells that were used to take control of other creatures and humanoids, but these spells now fall into the school of illusion. One particular spell had the ability to control undead, but that now falls into the school of restoration. There are three known groups of creatures which are known in conjuration. Daedra, whether lesser Daedra like a mere scamp, or more powerful ones like Dramora. Undead, such as skeletons and wraiths. And the third one being natural creatures, such as bears or wolves. Weapons and armor that are conjured are typically Daedric in design, but do not hold the same strength and durability as normal Daedric armor or weapons would. Many can confuse this school with the arts of necromancy, as some necromantic rituals, particularly involving reanimation of the dead, often overlay with conjuration magic. It was in the Third Era, 431, that specialization in the school of magic had become the responsibility for the guild hall located in Coral. Alteration is the school that manipulates the physical plane, along with the magical properties of the target. Alteration magic holds the ability to make an object heavier or lighter, creating a shield made of magicka around the target to simulate armor, along with spells to breathe in or walk on water, along with the opening of complex locks. Alteration can sometimes be confused with illusion magic, however the differences between the two is that alteration alters the physical plane where illusion is meant as more of trickery into thinking that the physical plane is being altered, but both of these schools' motives are to distort the truth. Alteration magic affects all, whether it is the target, the caster, or the environment, whereas illusion can only fool the caster and the target. This school appears to date its origins with the Aeliads located in the southernmost areas of Cyrodiil, not too long into the First Era. As Alessia and her armies had marched across Cyrodiil, liberating more and more humans for her cause, the Aeliads designed the School of Magic to combat against the forces of Alessia. Their quick expertise of the school became prevalent around the area of what is now known as Breville. Alteration had been proven to be quite useful in battle, as later in the First Era, the Imperial forces had outsmarted Vivek by navigating an entire army under the Lake Coronati to take control of the city of Aldmarak. Because of Alteration's usefulness in offensive battle techniques, Berevar Barrow, the illusionist, believed that the School of Destruction should instead be merged into the School of Alteration. In the Third Era 431, Alteration magic became the responsibility of the Guild Hall in Shadenal. Shield spells can split into two categories as well. One protects the caster from a portion of attacks, and the other also performs this, but can add extra needed cushioning against elemental attacks such as frost. Spells that alter the weight of an object can make it heavier or lighter. One popular effect of feathering oneself can make supplies lighter while traveling, and burdening can make the objects much heavier. Alteration is a quite popular school because of its vast amount of uses, even in everyday uses, 
with especially broad uses that allow oneself to breathe underwater or to walk amongst the surface of it. There also exist spells that make oneself travel much faster in water, but in terms of alteration magic, it has become outdated and less useful than similar restoration spells that grant speed on land and in water. Alteration magic is also useful for locking containers or doors, or opening them. Aeronautical spells can manipulate objects through the air, granting someone the ability to jump much higher and farther than they could through normal means, making an object fall faster or slower, being able to completely debilitate fall damage. Another spell that can be achieved by some of the greatest wizards who master this school is levitation allowing the caster to essentially fly or float. However, after the Levitation Act of the Third Era 421, this practice is no longer allowed with the danger that can occur, and are not practiced or taught any longer. Alteration magic also allows for sources of light to be summoned by the caster to illuminate their surroundings or a target. Illusion magic affects the mind and senses of the target. Illusion spells can command, unnerve, paralyze, silence, and can cause targets to become inexplicably hostile. Along with damaging effects to the target, illusion magic can greatly benefit an individual, such as rallying, charming, calming, invisibility, night vision, making it translucent, or granting illumination. Illusion magic can also create or douse noise, light, smell, and sight. Illusion magic, since it is dependent on the fragility of the mind affected, can likely fail if the spell is weak or the target is strong-willed. The ability of forcing the will of a caster onto the target has recently been introduced into this school and was once originally considered to be conjuration magic. Illusion magic, if used skillfully and strategically, can greatly affect the events to come. One of the most infamous uses of illusion magic was when Jaegar Tharn utilized powerful illusion spells to banish Uriel Septim VII to oblivion, assume his image, and allowing him complete control over the Empire for an entire decade. In the Third Era 431, this school of magic was held responsible for further studying by the Guildhall located in Breville. Spells that affect visibility come in two fashions, Invisibility and Chameleon. Invisibility, while useful, is only useful until the caster interacts with something, or performs any action other than movement with their feet. Chameleon, however, can blend the target with the surroundings in different levels as chosen by the caster, whether partially transparent or fully transparent. Although unlike Invisibility, Chameleon isn't affected by interaction. High-level chameleon spells are typically quite consuming of power, so invisibility is preferred if the caster simply does not want to be seen in regular movement. Spells that affect light can produce or douse light in a given area. Dousing light typically means something such as dimming lights currently functioning. However, magic that can create perfect and pure darkness or shadow has yet to be discovered or produced by modern mages. Noise spells, similarly to visibility spells, also come in two fashions. One muffles or prevents noises, while the other creates or alters current noise. Muffling and preventing noise, while altering physical noise, can also, in a sense, silence magic, meaning these spells are quite useful against those who prefer magic in offense, as it prevents them from utilizing any of their spells. The spells that create or alter noise causes targets to sense that they hear something, ranging from soft whispering to incredibly loud dissonance. This noise can greatly distract or even inflict pain on those affected. Despite the usefulness of the latter spell type, it has fallen out of favor with most modern mages. Another spell that has lost its favor with modern mages is spells that render a target blind whether granting them poor sight or complete and total blindness. Spells that paralyze are incredibly powerful and consuming, and can make it so the target is completely petrified, forbidding movement for a period of time. Spells that grant vision in the dark 
can only be casted on the caster and are useful for remaining undetected or seeing one's surroundings in the dark. Another set of useful spells in the Illusion School are spells that affect a target's current mood or hostility, such as Frenzying and Calming. Frenzying makes a creature inexplicably hostile, making them attack anything on sight, even against those who they would never lash out on. Ranging from simple arguing to murder, whereas Calming affects those who are already hostile, making them halt all attacks, including against those who they would normally lash out on. Demoralizing and rallying can produce similar effects. Demoralizing makes it so a target who is currently hostile flee in terror from battle, whereas rallying can take those who are currently fleeing from battle immediately join in on the battle despite their fear. Charm spells can make a target no longer hostile, fleeing, or feel any hostility at all towards the caster. This allows the caster to convince others things they normally wouldn't be able to through normal means, barter with them, or even rob the target without them lifting a finger in retaliation. There also exist spells that cast a trail for the caster to follow to find their ultimate goal, such as clairvoyance. The School of Mysticism is a more obscure and outdated school of magic. Mysticism is arguably the least understood of the schools because of the amount of possibilities it holds, and many of the spells often cross over into other schools because of this. Mysticism is understood to alter the nature of magic itself, and the manipulation of magical forces and boundaries to bypass structures and limitations of the physical world. Many mysticism spells can trap a target's soul, magic that now exists in the Conjuration School, so can often be mistaken for necromancy. Many spells in the mysticism school are able to detect life, reflect attacks, absorb spells or magic, dispelling oneself of magic, and trapping souls. Telekinesis was also once part of this school, but now belongs to Alteration. This school has been through much debate among mages and scholars throughout history. Mysticism holds its origins with the Sigic Order, and call their study of this school the Old Way, suggesting mysticism is actually quite ancient in origin. Mysticism is told to deal with conundrums and paradoxes, abandoning science in all sense, to embrace a temporary sort of insanity. Mysticism is likely able to harm those learning it because of its mental and traumatic effects on the mage's mind, that is, if they are learning it without proper preparation or teachers. During the Second Era, this school of magic was also quite popular with the Reachmen shamans who lived in the Reach of Skyrim. In the Third Era, the leader of the Mages' Guild, Hannibal Traven, was the figurehead into the act of banning necromancy from the Mages' Guild. In retaliation, those who favored necromancy in their practices used the excuse of mysticism being their practice as to protect their arts. Mysticism spells can be split into five forms, transport, detection, absorption, reflection, and the other class, only known as other, because of the vast amount of spells in this category, and they manipulate directly upon the forces of the unseen world. Since the falling out of this school, absorption magic is often clumped with the school of restoration. Spells that transport items or individuals are typically used in locations that do not have proper travel methods, such as poorly developed roads or difficult terrain. These spells allow a user to seemingly teleport to a place they've been prior, or to teleport to a location with flowing magic, such as a way shrine or a portal of sorts. Spells that detect surroundings are plentiful as well, such as locating living, breathing life forms as well as undead, hostiles, or even plain objects. Spells that utilize absorption allow the caster to absorb energy input into output, meaning incoming hostile spells can be absorbed by the caster to utilize as their own or transfer to their magic reserves. Absorption spells include a variety of effects, such as attributes, skills, health, magicka, or other aspects of the target's image. Reflection spells work in the opposite fashion of absorption spells, meaning any incoming hostile spells are reflected back at the target, 
either in full or in part, similarly the way a shield would. Spells that dispel are able to remove any active or ill effects placed on the caster. If the caster is burdened, silenced, and a variety of other inconvenient magical effects can be removed by dispelling them. Telekinesis allows the caster to move objects or individuals without physically touching said target. Soul trapping has been the most disputed aspect of this school, allowing the caster to trap one's soul, whether a humanoid, animal, or even Daedra, into a soul gem that befits the soul that has been trapped, typically used to recharge an enchanted item, or used in a number of magical rituals. Souls are divided into white souls and black souls. Animals or lesser creatures typically hold white souls and can be placed in petty, lesser, common, greater, and grand soul gems, whereas black soul gems are mostly used exclusively for black souls, meaning souls from mortals such as man, myrrh, and beast folk alike, but can also hold white souls as well if it is the only option. In the Third Era 431, the Guildhall in Leowin had become responsible for further studying and management of mysticism magic. After the Oblivion Crisis, however, mysticism had no longer been considered a school of magic from the College of Winterhold. Although the College of Winterhold held no specialist in this school, nor taught or sold any spells in the school, does not mean that mysticism has completely fallen out of mage hands just less popular among many of the tutors, especially in Skyrim, and many mysticism spells had been simply moved to other schools of magic. The School of Thaumaturgy was once a powerful and major school of study at one point in time. Thaumaturgy was quite similar to the modern-day school of alteration, but doesn't manipulate the physical appearance of what it is managing but does change the laws of said environment of objects temporarily. Thaumaturgy is the school of magic that likely went through the most changes and revision by many campuses and institutions for learning magic throughout history. After the warp in the west, Thaumaturgy had been displaced and rearranged into other schools of magic, and was mostly replaced in the widening favor of conjuration. Thaumaturgy included a wide variety of spells that are now moved to other schools, such as levitation, etherealness, detection, pacification, water manipulation, teleportation, conjuration, and simple manipulation of magic. Conjuration spells are powerful in the sense that they can summon from other planes, whereas thaumaturgy conjuring spells can only conjure from what is close to the caster. In the Battle Spire, much of the enchanted items that held magic upon them were typically doused in thaumaturgy. Thaumaturgy is no longer considered a school of magic, however many spells live on in other schools, while other thaumaturgy spells have completely been forgotten to time and replaced with newer and better spells. Enchanting, while not considered a school of magic, is a magic process that most mages are familiar with or utilize in their daily life. Enchanting adds magical and powerful effects to objects such as armor, weapons, and even mundane objects such as forks. Enchanting cannot be done without use of a soul gem, and the power of the object is determined by the size of the soul being applied to it, along with the skill of the mage creating the enchanted object. Over time, as the object is used, the enchantment diminishes on it, and can be recharged with use of another soul gem or even multiple soul gems. It is told that a woman named Raven Dereni had designed enchanting in the first era, although many scholars consider that enchanting already existed, but was quite poorly understood and often failed. Raven Dereni is believed to merely have revolutionized the way that modern enchanting is now performed. Scrolls are enchanted sheets of parchment, doused in magicka and engraved with incantations that are meant to be read aloud upon usage. Scrolls are similar to staves in the sense that they do not utilize one's magicka reserves, however, scrolls can only be used once, after which they disintegrate. Scrolls can be used by anyone, even if their skill in magic is quite low, making someone with little to no skill in magic able to cast a master level spell if they so wished, 
without the magicka reserves or the expertise on how to exactly cast that spell. However, scrolls can be quite costly, especially that of higher level spells forged under them. Spells cannot be learned from scrolls, however, even if the spell is written directly on it. Spell tomes are used to actually learn a specific spell. Enchantments range in an incredible amount of effects and potency, ones that can greatly benefit the user or the target, or ones that can greatly damage the user or the target. Many mages prefer to use enchanted staves instead of magic, as it doesn't allow them to consume any of their own magicka. Even the most powerful artifacts, whether Adric or Daedric in origin, are typically enchanted and can be recharged similarly to how normal enchanted items can. Alchemy, while not a school of magic, is often used hand in hand with mages, similarly to how enchanting is. Alchemy involves the art of making alchemical concoctions in the form of a consumable liquid, typically. It involves boiling, distilling, and extracting natural substances to obtain their properties, such as vampire dust turning one invisible, or food items restoring stamina and health. The kinds of liquids that can be made are usually potions and poisons, potions granting positive effects and poisons granting negative effects. Poisons can be drunk, but typically are applied to weapons such as arrows to pierce the target allowing the poison to drift through the bloodstream, quickly afflicting the target. All chemical ingredients include a variety of organic materials such as plant, animal, undead, and even daedra. Some ingredients are incredibly rare or difficult to get, making them incredibly valued by alchemists and potion makers alike. Many alchemists, if unsure what an ingredient's effect may yield, sometimes consume a bit of the ingredient themselves to discover what effects and properties it holds. This practice of eating ingredients is known as wartcraft. Many buildings are equipped with an alchemy station, where one can utilize a table of sorts with all the supplies they need. Whereas mobile tools such as a mortar and pestle, an alembic, a calcinator, and retort can be carried on individuals to make potions while in transit. In the Iliac Bay region, Alchemy stations were mostly used exclusively in temples, and even the Dark Brotherhood to make powerful and deadly poisons. Cyrodiil and Morwen notably were more keen to carrying the individual required alchemical components on oneself for easy access. The mortar and pestle are used to grind and mash the needed ingredients into a kind of paste, and to mix all the ingredients together. The retort is the vessel that is then used to distill, transform, purify, and boil the ingredients after mashed into a fine paste, often mixed with water or other liquids to enhance its drinkability. The calcinator operates as a sort of stove, and while an optional step in the potion making process, it can be used to even further enhance and augment the effects of the potion being made. It is able to refine the materials into ash and divide the important organic parts from the rest of the concoction. The Alembic works similarly to a calcinator, but it is used to decrease the negative effects a potion may impose. The Alembic can divide the arcane from the non-arcane, infuse them, and heat it into a vapor. The vapor condenses into other containers, and can be used to distill and drip down into the final concoction. Alchemy is believed to have been refined into a modern science by Asleel Dereni. Among other magical abilities, many are able to produce spell-like effects without expending magicka simply known as powers. Powers cost nothing to cast, and rather than being learned by tomes, these are effects that can be inborn to the individual, such as a Bosmer's ability to calm animals much easier than other races may be able to, an Argonian's ability to communicate with the Hist, or even powers gifted magically from a Daedric Prince, as with the Nightingales. And these kinds of powers, while not using magicka, can typically only be casted once a day. Some armor and artifacts can equip people who bear it with powers, such as enchanted effects that can never drain as normal enchantments would. While spells must be learned in some way, shape, or form, powers can be inborn and come natural to its user.
Necromancy, necromantic arts, dark arts, or dark practice is by far the most controversial of the magic schools, and rather isn't considered a school of magic but its own arcane art in and of itself. Necromancy involves the utilization of undead, corpses, and souls. Dragons know this art as Alok Delon. Many cultures on Tamriel despise necromancy because of the typical dark and immoral practices it can impose on individuals, along with many necromancers becoming absorbed by their power such as Manamarco. Many cultures dictate differently on what can be considered necromancy. Some cultures regard the reanimation of bodies to be necromancy, while others consider even soul trapping an offense in the name necromancy. In the most extensive view of what necromancy is, it can be considered any magic that involves use of a soul. Some consider it a branch of conjuration, while others consider it something completely on its own. Most cultures highly despise and forbid the practice of necromancy, and can be punishable by death or exile in most nations. Most necromancers practice their arts in secret because of this. Some necromancers do indeed plan on using their knowledge and power in the name of evil, while others may practice it out of curiosity, the search for knowledge, or experimentation. Many groups throughout history have used necromancy in warfare. Much knowledge on necromancy is achieved through Daedric interference, mostly with the Daedric Prince Malag Bal, and vampirism is often understood to be its own form of necromancy. The Slode of Thras are told to be quite skilled in the art of necromancy out of all the races in Tamriel, and often use their knowledge and infinite power with necromancy to their advantage. Blood magic is an incredibly ancient and often evil form of magic, mostly exclusive to vampires who reside in powerful and ancient bloodlines. Blood magic is used to drain the life from others, reanimate corpses, lift others from their feet, summon vampiric guardians such as gargoyles, and paralyzing their foes. Those who hold the ability to transform into a vampire lord can only utilize blood magic whilst they are in levitation. Lesser vampires can also utilize blood magic to great effect, often siphoning and absorbing the health from mortals. Many applications involving blood magic is created by what is known as blood forges and artifacts that contain blood magic power. A clan of vampiric orcs known as the Morkul clan were once in possession of an artifact known as the Hand of Morkul, a tool with the destructive power of merging living hostages into a weapon or armor. This clan worshipped Mephala and were capable of making stone servants and gargoyles to act as their protectors, utilizing powerful blood magic. A spring of red water known as the Blood of Moloch, a font of pure blood magica, was used by the orcish citizens of Abamath as a kind of war paint, as they believed it granted them immense strength. Throughout history there have been numerous blood forges and fonts of pure blood magic that many vampiric clans have used throughout centuries to receive powers from. Shadow magic is a lesser known and incredibly powerful form of magic. This magic was first utilized by Azra Nightwielder. Azra had discovered that shadows were not as simple as they appeared. While shadows are the absence of light and they appear when light is shown upon an object, producing a shadow, he also discovered that shadows appear as a dark reflection into worlds of terror and forces in conflict, such as two nations at war. Shadow magic is the manipulation and handling of the shadow present to create an effect against its source. Shadow magic competes with even the holy and magical powers of the Elder Scrolls, making shadow magic one of the most powerful known forms of all magic. Shadow magic, like the Elder Scrolls, can alter the past, present, and future through the use of manipulating shadows. Shadow magic tends to corrupt its caster because of the immense power situated in their hands and are typically distrusted because of this. Shadow magic is popularly studied around the borders that meet at Hammerfell, High Rock, and Skyrim, but is incredibly rare in most areas outside of this territory. During the Second Era, Many talented warriors known as Nightblades were proficient in this type of magic. 
Azra, the progenitor of shadow magic, attempted to use his powers as a shadow mage to manipulate his own shadow to fuse all possible and parallel versions of himself into one entity. After a clash with Red Guard soldiers, he vanished, and unfortunately his experiment with his self-meld never occurred in full. After the vanishing of Azra, multiple other talented shadow mages were inspired to attempt the same thing, and desired to take his place as figurehead and wanted to research shadow magic even further. Some of these mages included those such as Pergen Asul and Skelos Andriel. Shadow magic was a key element used in the War of Bendir Mak. A significant portion of conflict and struggles that were caused by this war manifested itself into a large entity of shadow called Umbra Keth, otherwise known as the Shadow of Conflict. Yegar Tharn and the Shadow Mage Pergen Asul had fought against each other to gain possession and control over this entity. A hero known as the Soul of Conflict, with the help of Skelos Andriel and Azra Nightwielder, who had made their return, used the forces of the Star Teeth, magical and enchanted crystals from Aetherius that hold the ability to counter shadow magic, to destroy this large shadow being. One common use of shadow magic is used in the construction of what is known as shadow gates, powerful seals placed on containers or rooms that can only be unlocked utilizing a shadow key. There exists only 11 known shadow keys. Shadows can be absorbed into oneself to strengthen their intellect and mind. With shadow magic, shadows can be forged onto artifacts and items such as weapons, as a blade known as Shadow Saver was a sword made of pure shadow. Night blades throughout the Second Era utilized shadow magic to step through the shadows, teleport themselves, and absorb the life force of others. Exceptionally powerful individuals proficient in shadow magic can travel to realms known as shadow worlds, alternate dimensions of the real world, to assist another version of themselves. These other versions of themselves can be conjured into the real world to assist the caster. The only way to break this connection is for the shadow version of themselves to die in the real world, or for the caster to perish within the shadow world. The Obsidian Husk, an obscure and a very little understood artifact of Mephala, is believed to have some connection with shadow magic, as it holds the ability to conjure and manage shadow beings, ranging from small shadowlings to creatures that hold unknown power. Flesh magic is an incredibly obscure and primordial kind of magic. Some believe this ancient form of magic is older than Nern itself. Some practitioners of this magic refer to it as the Sixth Element, or rather, Flesh. According to tales and legends, Flesh, along with the other five elements of Earth, Water, Air, Fire, and Light, were constructed upon the moment darkness was taken by day, and the Void had taken shape. Flesh magic is told to have been hidden by virtue of its own self-awareness. Flesh magic is arguably one of the most secretive, unknown, and cryptic magics known. Flesh magic can be compared to necromancy. However, with necromancy, it deals with dead flesh and bodies, while flesh magic molds and creates off of existing living flesh, meat, blood, bone, and breath. These are considered the fundamental elements of true flesh. Each component serves a purpose in flesh magic, and serves an important role in life. Meat and muscle is told to hold the desire to consume everything around it. Blood is the essential fluid that holds the elixir of life. Bone supplies the form and structure, and breath allows movement and ebbs the flow of the spirit. Flesh Atronax can be forged with this knowledge through incantations and rituals. Even with flesh magic and necromancy being separate practices, some mages, because of the parallels between the two magics, consider them the same. Others sometimes place it in the school of conjuration. Flesh magic was first documented in ancient Aldemary documents, although no one knows the exact authors or origins of these documents. Around the Second Era 230, Manamarco had dabbled in flesh magic before he had been exiled from the Sigic Order. 
He managed to craft a flesh colossus in a secluded lair before he was then discovered by the Sigic Order and was afterwards exiled because of dark practices. During the Plain Meld, this kind of magic was quite popular. Many of Molagbal's minions and those who followed Mana Marco had become quite familiar and inspired to use this ancient magic. However, after the Second Era, this practice became almost non-existent and much more obscure to mages. Many have forgotten its spells and uses. Flesh magic, similarly to necromancy, has become despised across Tamriel, likely because of the misconceptions about them being one and the same. Only two known practitioners of this magic are known to currently exist, and both are told to be deranged. A member of the Mages Guild in the Third Era named Relmina Varanim had commenced with research into studying this ancient magic, overseeing dark and controversial experiments to further understand the uses of this magic. Relmina had been exiled from the guild because of her practices. Shia Gorath had come to her with open arms, and she had taken up residence in his realm. With her expertise and knowledge, she had managed to create the infamous Gatekeeper, a colossal and near impassable flesh atronach who protects impostors from exiting the fringe of these shivering isles. Another known practitioner as of modern times was Calixto Corium in Skyrim. Calixto had run a museum of sorts in the city of Windhelm in the Fourth Era. After his sister had been killed, he wished to bring her back to life through experimentations in flesh magic. After he was driven mad and had become obsessed with this magic along with necromantic practices, he ended up murdering several women in the city, but was ultimately discovered after much investigation and was executed. There exists magic exclusive to a specific individual or a group of individuals in the world. One of these magics known is the Thum, also known as the Storm Voice or simply the Voice. It is a form of magic that consists of shouting pure magicka from one's mouth. Shouts are quite loud and destructive, and is almost exclusive and inherent to all Nords. Though this power can be learned by other races as well, it can be proven quite difficult, unless they are, of course, a Dragonborn, who is able to use the Thum without any prior training. Even Nords, who hold the ability more so than other races, must go through years of training, meditating, and enlightenment to be able to produce the voice. Those who study this kind of magic are known as tongues. Shouting can be used for a variety of purposes, from making a sword sharper, traveling at immense speed, commanding animals, or even taking over the will of a dragon. Many tales speak of the ancient ways of the voice being able to sing Shor's ghost into the world. Those who are incredibly proficient in the voice, such as the Greybeards, typically refrain from even muttering a single word, and may even gag themselves to prevent accidental catastrophe. The Thum is spoken in the language of dragons. Dragons hold no difference between an argument and a fight and use shouts in war against another, and is typically heard as dragon roars, but is in fact words in the dragon language, summoning spells of fire and frost to inflict damage against their enemy. Many legends in traditional Nordic folk tales speak of Kine, the Nordic goddess of the wind and known as Kinnereth to most of Tamriel. She had dispelled her breath upon the throat of the world to create the Nords. This breath of kind that was used to form them is believed to be what the Thum is remnants of, and is a magical effect gifted by kind to all Nords. The Shehai, or also known as a spirit sword, is an ethereal blade that was formed from the hands and soul of the warriors of the elite Yokudin Redguard sword singers called Anse. This powerful magic was quite popular in ancient Yokudin and Redguard history. This summonable blade was able to be conjured from pure willpower. However, this power is largely lost to history to most modern Redguards, as magic of most kind is looked down upon by most Redguards, and many prefer use of a physical scimitar. Being able to produce the Shehai was known as the Shehai Shensharu, translating to Way of the Spirit Sword. Learning how to summon this ethereal blade was achieved through rigorous training and scrupulous meditation. 
Though long ago, many tried to learn how to summon the Shehai, but not all could, let alone could they become an Ansei. Those who were able to become an Ansei and able to form the Shehai were incredibly gifted individuals, and some could go to great lengths to say that these fierce warriors were immortal. There were some individuals who were able to produce the blade from an incredibly young age without prior training, and held the potential to become even more fearsome as they grew older and quickly mastered this art. It is also told that a Shehai could be summoned during times of immense stress and fear. For one, to become an Ansei in the highest echelons, they must first master the ability to be able to call upon their Shehai. Shehai were described as being a pale, ethereal, and mystical blade that seemed to be made of pure light. Despite it being a blade or sword of sorts, some individuals manifested their Shehai to be of other forms, some recognizably a weapon, and some more abstract. After mastery of the Shehai, these gifted warriors would find no use in using conventional and physical weapons. Ansei in first and second tiers could not only be able to summon the Shehai, but utilize it to the greatest extent in battle. These higher tiered warriors were told to have Shehais that were much more brighter in color and proved to be much more fatal in battle. It is told that in order to end a skilled warrior such as this, one can only hope to dismember their head or control their mind with immensely powerful magic. The most talented of Ansei typically began their own training grounds to teach others of this art. Even though a Shehai proved far superior as opposed to a regular blade, it is told that the Shehai could be blown or shattered clean off of an Ansei, leaving its magical and ethereal essence as all that remains. Ansei, who were of the topmost ranks, typically traveled the sands and mountains, looking to end conflict among the people, help others, and engaging in immense warfare. For the uppermost ranks, a Shehai could be summoned with little to no effort, and was told to manifest as easily as breathing. In the mid-second era, the warrior constellation was told to have materialized in mortal form. This warrior was told to have wielded the most powerful of all Shehai likely ever seen, as it was able to create seismic waves and magical storms. Tonal architecture is an arcane art that takes the form of magic and engineering to its peak. Tonal architecture is more or less sound manipulation in order to efficiently alter the material plane. The most infamous users of this kind of magic was the Dwemer. The Dwemer, or rather those known as Tonal Architects, while utilizing this powerful magic, had to wear protective helmets and headgear to protect their ears and brain from the reverb and shockwaves exhibited to them in their work. The Dwemer, through mastery of this kind of magic, were able to use it in the greatest extent, using it for mining, constructing their magnificent underground cities, healing, and even in psychology and mental therapy. Archaic Chimeri documents tell of the Dwemer using tonal magic to bend others' will and mind to their needs. Through a hypnosis that entirely involves vibrations through the air, tonal resonators were colossal devices that the Dwemer utilized as a sort of engine, creating magnificent sound waves through piping and metal that could seemingly energize their surroundings. These tonal resonators could be used to generate powerful mind-bending waves that they could use in therapeutic ways and induce some kind of comfort, or they could rather be used to invoke terror and delusions to those who could be their enemies. This apparatus was told to have infinite and immeasurable possibilities. In the first era, after the Dwemer had discovered the heart of Lorcan and the immense potential hidden within it, Lord Kagranak, a Dwemeri chieftain, along with his subordinate tonal architects, forged what is known as Kagranak's tools creating Sunder, Keening, and Wraithguard, to properly and efficiently manipulate the heart's power. Through these tools, they had exhibited tonal architecture, and also had constructed their own god, the Numidium. However, upon fiddling with the heart to such an extent, the entirety of the Dwemer race had mysteriously disappeared, and have been absent from Nern for thousands of years. One dwarven resonator that was uncovered was in the Kwama mines of Gnesis, within a Dwemeri ruin that lay beneath the city. The Kwama that resided inside these mines had been driven mad by the waves produced by the resonator, causing them to turn on their queen and the miners who were at work inside. 
The miners who had worked in there had also been driven slowly mad by the reverberations of the resonator, humming its monotonous and maddening tune, and they had become obsessed by its composition, preoccupied with mastering their ability to recreate its pitches and vibrations. Those affected by this noise spoke of their minds being able to see the melody in a physical nature, seeing it glimmer and dance in their minds. The Soulless One had embarked to disable and render the ancient resonator inoperative, freeing the miners' minds from its madness. Many rumors and theories were soon spread that this particular dwarven resonator was in fact used to control the minds of any whose ears it so touches. Sotha Sil, a living god of the Dunmer, drew much of his inspiration from the machinations of the Dwemer, especially tonal magic. Even before the Dwemer's disappearance, Sotha Sil desired to know more about their peculiar talent with their arcane machinery. Sothasil dedicated much of his time researching tonal architecture, and how he could use it to empower his divine apparatus. He even further boiled the art down to yield even more potential, and in the process crafted Dwemeri tuning forks and divining rods. Sothasil also developed something known as the Resonant Sphere, one of his many ingenious wonders of the world. Upon contact with magic, this sphere produces sound that is near identical to the sounds heard within the Brass Fortress. There also exists a phenomenon of magic simply known as magical stones. Magical stones account for a broad existence of any stone, typically large, that holds significant power. Provinces are often dotted with things such as standing stones, in which hold the power of the constellations and gift mortals certain magical powers from them. Way shrines are magical stone constructs that mortals are able to use freely and magically travel across Tamriel. The Snow Elves were known to use magical stone structures, whether in their architecture, way shrines, or structures known as paragon platforms. Aelid stored the magical energies gifted by light into many different stones such as Welkened and Dark Welkened stones, along with Varla stones. These stones developed by the Aelids were made from the many meteoric shards known as meteoric glass, and had cascaded from the night sky, delivering them pure magicka from Aetherius. Some believe these heavenly pieces are shards of Aetherius, and some believe they are even some of the remains of Lorcan's heavenly body. Soul gems can be considered magical stones as well, and are found all across Tamriel in plentiful amounts, utilized to capture souls to enchant their gear. Doomstones and runestones are similar to standing stones, and some signify the powers of the birth signs, while others grant powers gifted from long-forgotten cults, ancient rulers and gods, some granted bound weapons, and some granted greater powers, and some can only be visited and preyed upon at a certain time of day. Lastly, statuettes and stone shrines dedicated to the divines or other deities can grant passive abilities to those who pray to them. Each god or goddess typically grants their own power within their sphere, and can even cure diseases. <laughs> 